This is The Cannamom Show, a podcast chronicling the inspiring stories of real women in the emerging cannabis industry. Your host, Joyce Gerber, mom, lawyer, political activist, has been speaking with women from coast to coast and around the world who are leaders in the revolution of cannabis and caregiving, continuing on her mission to lift up the stories of the women creating the cannabis industry by sharing their canna stories with you. So go make yourself a cup of tea or roll yourself a joint, sit back and learn something new about this magical plant on The Cannamom Show with Joyce Gerber. From the Tip O'Neill Studios in North Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's the Canna Mom Show. Now here's your host, Joyce Gerber. And welcome back to the Canna Mom Show. I am Joyce Gerber, and we are in our fifth season, continuing in our mission of crushing that stigma around cannabis and caregivers one canna story at a time. Um, all right, so Dave, remember mm-hmm. last week I spoke with a woman named Amy from Bountiful Farms about her pheno hunting? Of course. Uh, so I will not um, lie. I was intimidated by this. I don't think my nose is good enough for. <laughs> yeah. yeah. High level stuff. Yeah. It's very intimidating. So um, I slowed down and I did what they said to do. And I took the two different jars of cannabis just for a quick review for my listeners who may not have paid attention last week. It was the same strain, different seeds, I believe, which impacted the phenom, which is the actual, you know, the, the minutia of it, I guess is how I kind of mm-hmm. understand it. Mm-hmm. And I tried to distinguish between these two different um, phenos and I smelled them every day, sometimes four or five times a day. And I looked at them and I really, <laughs> it's like your children. I paid a lot of attention to it. And I think by the end of the five or six days of doing this, I felt like I actually could smell the difference and could actually maybe see a little difference too. So it's <laughs> attention. Well, it's, not, it's not in your head, right? Because after trying to do something for so long, you might kind of, you think you might, your brain might want to just kind of, submit <laughs> it, it could be so anyways in the, <laughs> it's it was a little exhausting it's um i would mm. just very i really don't think my smell is that like i don't my husband's a smeller he likes to like smell everything he's a chef like that is his basic hits his primary sense but i don't know if my smell is so good but i did feel like at the end of the week i could tell the difference between the two um i marked them and i did it several times a day to see if i was consistent and it took a little while but i could start to smell the little difference between the humulene and the pinene one and which one was a little bit gassier and which one was a little bit um well good pretty- for you i'm sure you, you could i'm sure you could uh it, it just uh it's i think to some extent you either have that or you don't you know some people are like can walk into a room and go hmm do you smell that like they must have a dog or something and i'm always the last one to smell it you know eventually it's like oh yeah i kind of smell that but yeah i'm kind of jealous of those people who go oh that's uh cardamom it's like what <laughs> that's ginger that's mint yeah i don't i don't smell i just smell something good you know so yeah i i, I don't i think my house probably smells like you know cannabis smoke and cats but everyone comes in and says it smells okay so <laughs> i don't know <laughs> Speaking of uh, children, have you given the, our listeners an update on your your plants that you've been growing in your is it your basement or your? Oh, so I actually gave a break for the summer. I had a little bit of issues with my last grow. I think the seeds weren't good. They started blooming before I changed the light. It was a little mysterious. I didn't go into it. So um, I'm going to try again this winter. All right, keep us updated. I'll keep yeah. close. And I, I got some new seeds from a woman um, owned company in Maine who I'm going to speak with because now you, I know you got to trust when you get your seeds. It's very important. Mm, yeah. It's a lot of things to learn in cannabis. All right. So anyways, if you're interested, you're listening and you're in Massachusetts and you want to try this bounty hunting pheno kit, I suggest it. It make, make your um, cannabis experience better. Mm. Okay. And let's see. Oh, so this was Boston Cannabis Week last week, which is actually two weeks ago because I record a week late. I know it's confusing. Anyways, there are some really great events. I went to a virtual event and I went to a high tea in Chelsea, mm. Massachusetts, who is um, hosted by my friend Mika Brown, the amazing Mika Brown. And she had this great, beautiful tea event like I did a couple of years ago with real tea cups and beautiful little pastries. And it was during the day, so I didn't have to go out at night. And it was just really pleasant and she highlighted black women in cannabis from across the country and i realized i'd interviewed so many of them there was dr bridget williams and asia atwood um nikki john peyton subrick i mean there are so many more so just thank you mika for highlighting all the women in boston cannabis week for doing that well uh, you should call the guinness book of world records that is the first ever 
tea party in Chelsea, Massachusetts. They're just not known. They're not known for that. Oh, I will. Okay. Anyone who's not from Boston doesn't know what we're talking about, but I went to Chelsea. <laughs> yep. They have the most beautiful views of Boston. This, this little restaurant where the event was held was on literally a cobblestone street. It could have been in, you know, <laughs> Beacon Hill, but it was underneath the Tobin bridge and it was very industrial everywhere else. Well, right. That. <laughs> <laughs> Chelsea is beautiful as long as you're looking at Boston. If you're looking at Chelsea, it's uh, nothing against Chelsea. Come on. Uh, they're our friends, but um, it, it's not the most picturesque town in the state. That's all. It's maybe a little uh, folky. Speaking yeah. of folky, so weird transition. My friend Victoria, husband, was listening to uh, Turkish folk music for some reason i don't know why and she decided this is something that would make me laugh so i thought it'd make you laugh too i don't know if dave's gonna play the video to sound it let's see what we're gonna do and it's see what you think it sounds like it's just the audio there wasn't really any video from this for this but yes very interesting let's take a listen It's your theme song. That's the Canamom theme song. They're singing about you. Clearly, you've inspired them somehow. I have literally no idea what that means in Turkish. If I have any Turkish listeners out there, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll get the research department on that. <laughs> the team, the cannabis show team. Mm. Oh, that was funny. Yeah, my friend Victoria, she does not connect it to cannabis in any way, shape, or form. She actually helps me work on, um, I volu- I don't volunteer. I work in Cambridge election. On the election day, I work in my local polling station. I'm one of those ladies. So um, she's been helping me. So <laughs> my cannabis and politics connection. So everyone knows. Even in Temple, Dave, this is true. On Yom Kippur, one of yes. my friends slide up to me next to me. In the, um, the synagogue, and said, Joyce, I'm taking CBN now. I'm like, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's funny. It's funny how they think they have to tell you on the down low. Everywhere. Uh, All right. <laughs> by the way, you will you might be interested to know, um, Turkish, Kanamam, translated to English, is I don't bleed. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a battle cry, I guess. I got to think about that. All right. Oh. <laughs> All right, well, we are, we're switching. Oh, you thought it was like a female? You think it's like a female thing? No. That's what it. You I, think? Um, that has, who, the, who the hell I'll knows? <laughs> I'm going to get some like weird mail. Okay. Not mail. Uh, text <laughs> messages. All right. Uh, Culture Corner. Dave, I'm bringing it back. So I oh. don't know if you have the music already. I didn't prepare you for this. So No, but uh, the um, the creative department here at the Cannamon Show always has it ready. We're on it. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. That's still Canamom. Hey, come on, Canamom. Going to replace right. Josh. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go with the Culture Corner. The Culture Corner. Okay. We're bringing it back. I have two recommendations this week um, a book and a TV show. So uh, I don't know if you've been watching the news. She's been everywhere. Cassidy Hutchinson. She's written a book called Enough. She was, if you don't know, Mark Meadows' aide who gave some pretty damning testimony at January 6th committee. And now she has um, all over the news shows. I saw her on The View, which is one of my favorites. I admit it. I watch The View every day. Oh, okay. um, she's an apostate. You know, she's renouncing that belief. Like even on The View, they're like, what was it? What kept you in this? You know, they keep calling it cult and she keeps sort of backing away. But something about being with a per- powerful personality, I don't know, it blinds you to something. And now she's on the other side and she's out there saying what she's saying. Mm. All right, then. That's interesting. So that's Cassidy Hutchinson's Enough. And then on Apple, and again, it's the women who came out. Just to point this out again. <laughs> who mm-hmm. came out and actually had the balls to stand up and say the so emperor does- has no clothes. <laughs> wow Talk about using a metaphor there Joyce but go ahead <laughs> it's, it's a lot of stuff going on here so yeah, that's a, a, a woman thing and then on Apple TV um, the third season of the morning show I think this is sort of a complicated woman in power dynamic this year and I'm, in, I'm really into it 
it's uh, Jennifer Aniston and Reese Witherspoon. And um, I honestly don't commit to many TV shows. I end up getting bored a little bit or don't go all the way through. But I've been following this one for a few seasons and I'm excited to see what happens in season three. I haven't seen one episode, which is a little odd because I'm such a fan of Steve Carell, uh, Massachusetts' own Steve Carell, of course. And he's on the show, right? Uh, first season. Only the first season? Okay. Still. Yeah, he's not, he's not a good guy in this one. Just be prepared, people. I, yeah, I heard. <laughs> I heard. Uh, yeah. But no, I've heard this is, this, some people call this show a guilty pleasure, that it's not exactly high art, but it's very enjoyable. Is that fair? Yes, and... The third season, again, is really focused on the women power thing that are a lot of women in power and what the men have been doing to mess things up and how they're going to, you know, I don't know. I've talked about this, you know, even just at events lately about how sometimes to get to be a woman in power, especially women a little bit older than me, my age too, I guess, you had to really play by the rules of the game that were set up by men and they were not so great. And sometimes they still did terrible things. And I think that this season, they're kind of investigating how women can kind of um, undermine the power of other women. And now maybe we're not going to do that anymore because we're thinking about it. We're talking about it. Lean in, would you say? No, I don't like lean in. I hate Cheryl Sandberg's message. I think that was stupid. <laughs> I just... <laughs> my my ex-wife was uh, summer roommates with um, Cheryl Sandberg. They were they were congressional pages together. Well, I'm and... sure she, she, she met well, but she had a lot of support behind her, which is why she could lean in. So I would love to be able to lean right. in. But what we really need is support and foundational uh, caregiving. I mean, again, back to cannabis, part of the issue of cannabis, she's a caregiving plant. This should be built in our image. And there aren't any support systems in this country for caregivers. So no matter how smart and capable and competent you are with a person, if you have a vagina and a child, there's no support system. So leaning in is a really terrible idea. Maybe you need to change the rules. Mm. Yeah, right. I'm with you. I, I'm not pro or con Cheryl Sandberg. I, I, whatever. I, I do think she stepped back a little bit after her husband passed. I mean, I hate to think that's such a tragedy, but you know, she could see maybe where she existed because sometimes when you're in it, you can't see where you are. Mm. Mm. Yeah, he died. He died on a treadmill. Uh, that's how I want to go. No, I'm not. Really. <laughs> I shouldn't. I shouldn't joke. It was tragic. It was. No, it's tragic. It's hard, but it was tragic. Yes. It's, I know. I'm gonna be on some kind of psychedelic trip. I've already planned it. Okay. <laughs> Not that I've even tried them yet, but it's going to happen if I keep talking about it. All right. Uh, last thing before I get to my guest, uh, shout out to any of my listeners near or in Belmont, Massachusetts. I've been talking with the owners of Cal Verde Naturals. It's a woman owned dispensary in Belmont. I've talked about it before, and we will be hosting an event on Wednesday evening, October 25th, and I'll be there. So come nice. on over. All right. Going to be introducing women, especially women in Belmont. Anyone knows about Belmont? It's a nice town. The ladies don't necessarily know how to go into a dispensary. My friend who I took in there had never been in one before and was sort of overwhelmed by it all. So we're going to introduce you slowly and have maybe have some crafts or some activities and things to help you um, understand how to use this plant medicine in your life. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, Belmont, is Belmont like a fancy? I don't think I've ever been to Belmont. It's like a fancy suburb kind of, yeah. isn't it? Mitt Romney yeah. used to live there. Oh, that's right. That's why we know it. Wow. Well. It's still a nice place for whatever. It's, it's got two cannabis dispensaries. All right. <laughs> Doesn't every town have at least two by now? <laughs> yeah, it they're, feels like it. They're popping up. All right. Uh, thank you, Dave, for indulging me again on my random thoughts. <laughs> Love it. Okay. Uh, we are going to be talking with a guest today, so let's get to it. Uh, today's guest is joining us from Missouri, I think. I have to check on that. I'm not sure where she is. Um, <laughs> she is a naturopathic doctor who has dedicated herself to supporting those in their healing. Early in her career, she was a chemist working in the pharmaceutical industry and then graduated from the four-year naturopathic doctor degree program at the Canadian College of Neuropathic Medicine. Today's guest has blended her own herbal formulas for patients for over the past 15 years and has formulated many natural products. This led her into medical cannabis. Today's guest provides high quality practitioner and patient education on plant medicine, cannabis safety, dosing, and use, and has joined the St. Louis University's Cannabis Science and Operations Program in Cannabis Pharmacology. She also operated as general manager for a medical cannabis dispensary, where she led the organization from a holistic patient focus. In addition to all that she does to heal her community, she also serves on the advisory board for the Missouri Cannabis Trade Association, is a board member on Jane, J-A-I-N-E, 
a women in cannabis focused organization. She has presented on global stages on topics such as neuroplasticity and neurological health, the endocannabinoid system and neuroprotective plants, the treatment of breast cancer with cannabis and overall plant medicine science. Today's guest is committed to using science in order to provide practical, reliable, and accessible therapies to patients. Cannabis is a science, not a belief system. So please welcome to the Cannamom Show, Dr. Jamila Owens Todd. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. All right. So just can you first just um, explain what a naturopathic doctor is? Yes. And then maybe sort of a brief overview how you got here, because I do want to talk about the science and all these different things that you can explain that I can't. Yeah, sure. A naturopathic doctor is, um, it's a four-year degree study of study where you focus on the disease process. So in a traditional medical school, you're learning pathology and immunology, and you're studying the body and the disease process. In the naturopathic program, we learn that same kind of physiology of the body, the disease process, the pathology. However, we learn a more alternative and holistic approach to healing those. So we still have to know the common drugs that are used in most disease processes. So what hypertensive drugs are used for those with high blood pressure, because we will then implement, let's say an herbal protocol in order to support the patient. And we need to make sure those herbs do not contraindicate their medic medication. So mm. Um, so we take it, you know, a, a little bit more. We have more clinical hours, believe it or not, um, than a medical doctor's program. You do have to have a bachelor's degree in order to enter into those programs. And it's about nine accredited schools within North America. I attended one that was in, in Canada. And then uh, once you graduate, you receive your doctorate. And there you are. Okay, so how did, uh, are you are in Missouri? Just want to confirm where you are. I am, So interestingly enough, I'm based in Missouri. However, I have okay. had clients across the United States and outside of the United States. So I would say I'm, I'm, I live, I sleep in Missouri most nights, <laughs> but I do travel quite a bit. Uh, and I didn't know you had like international. I just wasn't sure where you were based. Okay. Um. All right. So let's just talk about how you got here. You were a chemist and then you went into this. So how did that, how did you carve out, carve out this path and how did you come into cannabis, I cannabis. guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll try to give you the, you know, the cliff notes version of this. Okay. But I started my career um, as a chemistry major. That was my undergrad. I did a chemistry and French major. Don't ask. We'll talk about that another time. <laughs> Are you always from uh, Missouri? Or is that where you're from? Or is that? I um, am. I am. Okay. I'm born and raised in Missouri. Um, had the luxury of living in other parts of the world. And, and so I went and did my bachelor's degree in chemistry because I really loved to see how things worked. I wanted to know the science behind why things did what they did. And my goal was to pursue a PhD in organic chemistry because at that time I was going to find a cure for cancer. Hmm. Um, you know, so you still I, might. Yeah, yeah, hey, you never know. <laughs> and so graduating, I worked in pharmaceuticals. So I went into some major pharmaceutical companies. I worked a lot with narcotics and schedule one drugs mm -hmm. um, and did formulations for a pharmaceutical company. That's when I found the naturopathic program. And what, and and what year was this for you? Oh my goodness. Uh, I graduated in 90, 1999. All right. So it's way early uh, in the. Yeah. yeah so yeah yeah. 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 And then started my practice in naturopathic medicine, 2007. Now, because I had the chemistry background, I'd still as a naturopathic doctor worked with manufacturing facilities and doing natural products. So like supplement companies or holistic or natural beverage companies, I still did that kind of on the side, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then in about 2015, I started seeing a lot of my pediatric patients with seizure disorders or Tourette syndrome. And these patients were driving to Colorado at the time because huh. um, Missouri was not legal for cannabis. Right. And so I started working a lot with CBD and pediatric care because I didn't want to use cannabis with them. Mm -hmm. And then from there, um, Missouri became legal. I joined uh, one of the companies that I worked with with patients who had seizure disorders was local and so with that so back kind of back to your patients so when you they you could see that they were going uh with it what was the how how did their how did their families figure this out and how did they connect how did you even know what was going on were they talking yeah. to you about it so yeah they I had some patients coming to me saying hey have you heard about cannabis and how it helps with seizure disorders and at the time I was familiar with cannabis I used it or considered it for patients with uh, on chemo or cancer therapy um, seizure disorder, I saw, saw some of the literature in the science, but I wasn't implementing it because I was in an illegal state. 
well, the states, the country is illegal, right, but that's, right, illegal. Yeah. that's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so and then I was kind of concerned. I was like, well, instead of giving your, your kids. So I started to dive into the research and read what was out there. And there was a host of it, you know, Shulam, you had a lot of Israel and Russo. So you had, you know, all these, you know, resources of what was going on across uh, the globe. And I said, you know what, with some of the patients, it's like, let's try CBD. So you're not trafficking, you know, marijuana from Colorado to Missouri. And let's see some of the outcomes. And they were having, I was having really positive outcomes with pediatrics using um, the CBD in place of uh, their seizure medication. Now, let me just be clear. At the time, there was a local hospital that was considering CBD. So there were some neurologists who said, hey, these children are not responding to our top T AEDs, the anti-epileptic drugs, and let's consider CBD. We had someone growing medical CBD at the time in the state. And um, I was getting referrals from these neurologists to say, hey, you know, because I've taught classes in my practice about cannabis and CBD, just to give a little reference, Illinois was a legal state, which is our neighboring state. So if now they didn't have to go to Colorado, they can go to Illinois. And so it became a lot closer to home. And so I kind of jumped in and started teaching classes on like the safe cannabis use, how to implement it, you know, how to. That's a, I, again, I don't I don't talk to many medical professionals who are sort of on board early. Uh, so that's actually and especially with pediatric, that's a whole another level. So that's um, amazing yeah. that you're open to hear about it. All right. We can talk about a million other things. I'm trying to, keep, <laughs> trying to stay focused, people. Um, yes. All right. So you get into this, you can see it. And so this it was illegal when you started what's the status of cannabis now in missouri we're we're adult use or rec state so in 2018 it passed for medical and then in 20 what is this past year 2022 i think it passed mm -hmm. for adult use or rec and so okay. now we have a, a recreation or adult use okay so uh you are not okay so what are you doing now so what is the work that you so you were working with patients at a point and then um now what are you doing in the industry or in, in missouri all right just what are you doing yeah yeah, so I um so I work primarily with manufacturers. Um, the first manufacturing role I had was a research manager, and then I am now holding the role of a chief science officer. Uh, so where I do what I do there is making sure the facility is compliant. Um, I come up with formulations for products that are currently in the dispensary. So if someone's wanting to make their water soluble tea or beverage or lemonade, I'll make sure that the equipment is there, making sure the process is clean, create the kind of SOPs for the process. And then we go into production. So I train the production staff on how to, you know, make this product, how to up to scale it so that we can make large amounts of it and then also stay compliant within the industry. Which is a lot. This is a compliance industry. Everyone's like, this is going to be so fun. I'm like, no, it's compliance. A lot people. of compliance. All right. Um, yes. That's good. Okay. So manufacturing, Manufacturing processing, it's really an important part of this whole industry. A mm. uh, lot of problems, things are hard. <laughs> um, I don't know, maybe in a nutshell, can you explain <laughs> why it is so hard? I mean, again, compliance is complicated because it's so state specific. It's illegal federally. Uh, things yeah. need to be clean. This is a plant. So oh there's goodness. a lot of other things about the plant. So I don't know if you want to kind of do like a quick, I don't know, your yeah. top three of what is <laughs> What's the hardest or yeah. unique? Yeah. Um, Especially one thing about, about medical grade. I mean, you're talking to make sure people, this is a, you want a product that works for health and wellness for. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And I, I want to go back for a minute. Naturopathic medicine, our focus, one of our modalities is botanical medicine or herbal medicine. So we, um, if you are looking, no matter what state you're in for a practitioner to support you, naturopathic doctors really do understand how plants work in the body the method of action, the pharmacology of it, and how those plants work with prescriptions. So I say that to say, that's a challenge when you're manufacturing products because you're kind of, you're wanting to manipulate this product to be a lemonade or to be something. Um, and it is a plant. You know, I believe that plants and, you know, I get a little wonky on this, but I believe that plants are energetic. I believe they're gifts, they're healers. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have to allow them to do the healing work. Mm -hmm. So you have to juxtapose the plant just being in its natural element. You have to kind of juxtapose that with in the manufacturing, we need reproducibility. We need compliance. We need this product to always meet the standard and, you know, and pass these tests. So we're often trying to manipulate a plant 
to fit into our personal desires and needs and what we think people want. Um, so that's where a lot of times we kind of uh, bump heads, unfortunately. And so compliance is, it's still a scheduled product. It is still a GMP, a good manufacturing facility, a production facility. So we have to make sure we're doing the things by the state. Every state, no matter where you are, you're following your state's codes or regulations. And then you have to follow food code, local food code. And there are international standards. There are, there are health departments. So you still have to deal with that component in a manufacturing because it is essentially a manufacturing just because we're manufacturing cannabis does not take away from having good PPE and making sure you have an eyewash station and uh, following the you know certifications that are required for a laboratory setting so it's it's sometimes people realizing like oh this is a real live lab or facility and we have to as you talked about the compliance so some that's a bigger component with compliance is understanding cannabis once you cross over into manufacturing, it's no longer really just about the cannabis. It's also about a clean manufacturing facility. So I have that. And then in addition to, as I mentioned, the plant being manipulated to do everything that sometimes a plant's not supposed to do. Um, so that's a bit of the challenge. You know, I'm, I, I love the, the comment by Eeyore that, you know, weeds are plants too, if you listen to them kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in a perfect world, we would allow the plant to tell us what medicine we should get from it as opposed to telling the plant what we want from it. Um, so that's uh, a little bit more of my kind of. <laughs> yeah. All right. So right. again, it's the whole, <laughs> it, it's a, you're an interesting space. You're trying to standardize a product to make sure to sell it as to, to sell scale it, it as, as money and scale it, to, yeah. to, you know, and it's hard to keep it consistent. There's a, there's microbiology involved. I've talked to people. I don't understand any of this either, but um. All right. So let's just talk about some of the things we do. To, I talked a little bit before to you about extractions. Yeah. Uh, can you just talk a little bit for people just really, you know, we people are getting all sorts of products now, but they don't really know what they is are. are yeah. Is, yeah. Uh, the solvent list, the solvent uh, chemistry, CO2. Sure. Uh, can you explain sort of like the basics of how that is and why one might be, I don't know, more beneficial or not? I don't know. Just how. What, yeah, what, yeah. 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 That kind of part. Okay. Sure. Because um, when we're looking at the flower, we call that flower buds, the plant. We're typically consuming that in a very traditional way. We're taking those buds, we dry them, um, cure them is the other term. And then we grind them up when it's time to, to smoke, put them in our favorite paper or pipe or device, and then we consume them. And that's one of the most simplest way of consuming. Now we are all wanting to be innovative and we want cool things and we want edibles and we want beverages. In order to get that plant into a, an edible or a beverage, we have to extract we have to pull out those fats and then concentrate it and then use that in, to make all these really cool products. Um, and I always tell people extraction, I know it gets really, you know, for most folks, it's like, it's really complicated. We extract every day. If you drink tea or a coffee, that is an extraction. You take that tea bag, you place it in hot boiling water. The water is the solvent and the water pulls all the benefits of that plant out of the tea all the, you know, the, the catechins, the um, antioxidants, and then we consume that product. So it's the same. We go into a cannabis facility, we take the biomass, which is the flower. So we draw, talked about drying it or curing it. Um, that dried or cured flower, we grind that, and then we place it into an extraction machine. That can be a CO2 extraction, ethanol, or um, hydrocarbon, or also some people refer to as butane. Those are the most common extraction, hydrocarbons probably the most, um, but those are the most ex common extraction methods, which are all solvent extractions. CO2 becomes the ex the solvent. Butane is the solvent. Ethanol is the solvent. That solvent- So, so solvent like the water would be the solvent for my tea. Exactly. Those chemicals, ethanol, uh, carbon dioxide, chemicals are yeah. actually like the solvent. So you need to get Correct. rid of that after- Exactly. What happened next? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So those solvents pull out all of that THC, the, the cannabinoid, primarily THC, and then we collect that. But because we use the solvent, such as CO2, you really it's hydrocarbon where we have to then go into what we call a remediation or ethanol. We have to remediate. We have to now get rid of that solvent. We use the solvent to get all the good THC out. Then now we have post-processing. We have to get rid of that solvent and there are a lot of the extraction setups will have this kind of post-production 
step two of extraction. Um, then we have like distillate. So we go through a distillation process, which is just cleaning, taking out any extra impurities, making this quality, high quality, purified distillate. So you get this golden amber color, looks like honey kind of final product, which we are calling extract. We call distillate concentrate. Now that same concentrate is what goes into your vape pen. We call it distillate concentrate. Goes into your vape pen. Um, you can buy it as a wax shatter batter butter and you can dab these. So these concentrates show up in different forms of vaporization, which is your vape pen, or you can have it just as a concentrate They sell for a gram, typically half a gram. And then you take a little pinprick size amount of that and you dab it. That's in. So, you know, so they're just like literally like, like my brain doesn't really understand. So it's literally just like molecules. You're just taking molecules and then taking the other molecule. Like what happens to the um, CO? What happens to the ethanol when you what, so like, that, just like separates it out? Yeah. yeah so <laughs> when you are done like that remediation, you kind of clean it out. So you have to okay. do we put it in a very specific type of equipment, like a, roto, a rotary evaporator which just slightly heats the distillate and then it evaporates off mm. that excess solvent that we use to extract. So, and I wanted to mention, those are solvent based, <clears throat> but what we're hearing about now is solvent less, solvent less extraction. So the solvent base uses one of those methods to pull out all of the fatty THC. So THC is a really a fatty, fatty molecule. And we know that uh, oils and, and water doesn't mix and fats and oils don't mix. So we have these other methods of extraction, which are solvent less. So we're not using ethanol, CO2 or hydrocarbon. We're using usually heat or pressure. Hmm. And that's where you get rosin. So one of the big questions is when I go buy a vape, I can buy my distillate vape, which has the concentrate that's maybe hydrocarbon, that the solvent hydrocarbon pulls it out. And then I get rid of the hydrocarbon through a uh, vacuum oven to because you need a little bit of heat to get rid of that solvent mm -hmm. and now I have my final product I can put that into a vape and I can consume it well that's a distillate pen and then if you take those flowers and immediately as you harvest them instead of curing them you freeze them you flash freeze I heard you talking about terpenes mm -hmm. you flash freeze because the colder the better is going to make those terpenes more pronounced more rich more flavorful and then you take that frozen flour and extract that is now called resin or live resin. So that's it. Okay. So there's live resin and live rosin. Is that, or right. is that live? Yes. The so live resin is the frozen flour that is going through a regular solvent extraction. Okay. Live rosin, you take that flour and then you don't go through any traditional extraction method. You go to make bubble hash, which you can use a a washing machine you can use um so your or hand um uh, extraction so you're using a very rudimentary cold setting that does not involve any type of solvent whatsoever and you make this bubble hash so some of the old school like when you look at the history of what hash was just this little brown waxy ball um, you can find in parts of Nepal, they do something called bang lassi and they take the cannabis leaves and just bang them against fabric and they collect all of the sticky. So the sticky parts of the plant, that's what we're trying to extract or pull off from cannabis. Um, so when we use uh, the solvent methods, the solvent itself pulls it apart. The non-solvent, we have to do something physical or manual. So ice, uh, ice hash or bubble hash is how we'll make that. And then we press that waxy ball between it's like a flat iron for your hair uh, we put some wax paper and you press that and now you get the purest form of extract or or um you know from your flower and that's called live rosin wow all right so i've been seeing <laughs> these know, terms right? and like people talking to me for a long time so that's just a very sciencey that's a lot of stuff so is there a like I imagine there's some sort of medical benefits to not having a solvent is that true or is there any kind of benefit is there, well, is there or not? Does it I mean, matter? It depends on who you speak to, right? Because there's some people who say, oh, the solvents aren't an issue because you do remove them. Because mm -hmm. that's what a lot of the states, they every state tests for residual solvents. Or is, is there a residual? Are there any leftover solvents after your extraction? There should be none in your state because the state laws are pretty much consistent across the board and you should not have residual solvents. And that's what makes it healthy to consume. 
Now, live rosin is saying, hey, we didn't go through any solvent process. It's just pure. It's high yield. It's a lot of tea, lots of flavor. So you can just consume me and you don't have to worry about any residual solvent. So that's the cleaner, you know, um, component of rosin. Every Everyone's going to have their kind of what's the best to do that's and right. what's the best result. I so, get but that must be like labor about. intensive, though. I imagine a live rosin is a much more labor intensive process. Is that true? Um, it's a, it's probably cause they all kind of have this post product. They all have to either remediate and getting rid of that solvent with, um, live rosin. It's not, at, it's about the same. It I is interesting. Okay. All right. That's very fascinating. All right. We've only got a couple, we've got like five minutes left, so we got to keep going. All right. Uh, nanotechnology. Is this some sort of innovation? What is happening in nanotechnology? What do you see is the next thing coming around in, um, manufacturing? Again, this is a plant. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So nanotechnology. So essentially the plant is a, is a fat. You're getting all the fatty molecules. Fat does not like water, right? Oil and water does not mix. So what nanotech, the fancy word is nanotechnology. Essentially what it is, is blending. It's a high sheer blender. So you can't throw it in your regular blender, but what you're doing is you're taking this very specialized piece of equipment. You're putting that very fatty THC distillate or extract and then you're putting it into a solution and breaking it up. So it's shearing, it's vibrating at such a high rate that it breaks that fat molecule into teeny, teeny, tiny fat molecules that now are easier to absorb in the body. So ideally you have to mix your fatty distillate into you know, your gummies or you have to make it into you know, a cookie or brownie and then it, you can eat it that way. Well, to make water soluble juices, lemonade, you know, teas, beverages, you are essentially, you're not blend, you're breaking this fatty molecule down so that it floats and disperses evenly in this water container of lemonade. So when you do nanotechnology, you're just asking this molecule to be broken down in such teeny tiny molecules that it can float throughout. And so when you take a capsule as your dose, you're getting an even distribution because the molecules are so tiny and then they get into the bloodstream a little bit more quickly because they're smaller and able to pass through. Where right. normally that fat molecule is so big that it's not going to absorb if it's just in the mouth. Well, that's because there are so many more beverages out there and there are lots more um, like powdery things that you can put into water, <laughs> yes. which I never thought was possible, but now that kind of explains what that is. All right. Yes. Uh, Edibles, you just sort of mentioned it. So edibles do work differently <laughs> on the body. I, I've always understood it because it has to go through the liver. It literally becomes a different molecule. Can you explain uh, why, you know, what the chemical transition is, I guess, and like why you could actually, you experience it differently? Like you had mentioned, the nano gets into your bloodstream, but this goes somewhere else. Yeah, so TAC, which is Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, when we ingest it and chew it and get it into the body, it goes through the liver to be broken down. <clears throat> but when it gets to the liver, there's an activity that happens where that delta-9 converts into 11 hydroxy tetrahydrocannabinol. And so that molecule is more intense in its action. It lasts longer. And that's why edibles have a more you know, <laughs> intense reaction. So the effects can last when you consume flour, you smoke it, you feel the effects two to six hours. Edibles can go two to eight hours as far as the length of the effects. And you've heard of those stories of someone waking up high the next day because they consumed a large amount. And so the liver is really key in producing um, the new molecule whenever you consume an edible in its, its um, food form. Because now you have to get to breaking down a carbohydrate. It's, a, it's now n nutrition. How does the body normally break down carbohydrates? How, do, does, how does the body break down proteins? So all of that has to be considered with an edible. And now you got to think about this new molecule that's produced in the liver that you're dealing with the effect. So that high is often more intense and lasting longer. Wow. So if someone has liver disease or any kind of liver issues, should they not be using edibles? I know they're not supposed to drink. Um, <laughs> uh, not necessarily. So here's yeah. the thing. Some people with like, um, depending if they're fast metabolizers or slow metabolizers, there's always that one person that's like, I eat edibles and I notice nothing. And so their body may not process it efficiently. Therefore, they don't get the benefit of that conversion, that turnover to that new molecule. So it just kind of goes through their system. So it won't necessarily create a harm. They just may not notice anything from it because the body isn't efficient and making that new molecule and it just processes and goes through their system. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Uh, 
Let's see what do I have time for. Um, I don't know. Let's just go back to you. <laughs> That's a lot of science. That's a, again, there's people out there. It's like they think it's voodoo magic. You know, you take these magic cannabis edibles, edibles, and things will get better. But this is interacting with other body functions. It's interacting with other medications. It's yeah. you know, again, personalized medicine. So there's a lot to understand, and I don't really understand the concentrates. And I've been doing this for five years. So that was a really good explanation of the molecules, the chemistry, the, the part of it that's sort of like mysterious to us. It's not just like a cookie yeah. or a gummy. Right. And that's the biggest question I get. I mean, there are people I know who've been in the industry, who've been consuming for years. And they're like, what are exactly your concentrates? Um, and I mean, there's a plus and a minus. Like it's like I said, it's it's innovation. It's new. It's another way to consume. We have more seniors. We have people that want the discretion. They want to be discreet. You know, or you can go to a bar now, like if you don't consume alcohol, you can add your little powder or drops to your beverage and you can still be social and vibe, have the have the effect of, you know, feeling calm and relaxed and not taking in alcohol. So it has expanded our opportunity to oh, absolutely. consume cannabis. But then it comes with, again, how much are we manipulating the plant? How much is that consistent? You know, and I always tell people, whether you're a manufacturer or you're a consumer, be patient. So sometimes you may get a batch and it's like, I didn't notice the same effects. It That is kind of what should happen because every crop that's grown, even though you can have Blue Dream grown by the same cultivator, every you know growth cycle, that fifth cycle could be really different from the second cycle because it should be, it's a plant. So no one wants that, to hear that. that, that that's what I learned. That's what I learned in my pheno hunting yeah. is that yeah. and. When I was mentioning this early on, when I started trying to grow and I said, the plants look different. And my friend said, well, do your kids look different? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the hardest thing. Sometimes. It's like, it's like fine dining. Like, yeah, you want the meal to be great every time, but it may taste a little different the next time. That's okay. That's a part of using natural medicine. You know, I always tell people when you buy natural products, think about your, your salad dressing. You go and get that Greek dressing. It's going to, you see all types of separation, right? as you should. The vinegar, you got the oil. And that's what natural products look like. So I think what I love about cannabis, it's introducing us to natural products and they should not all be consistent. We should expect some differences. Again, no operator wants to hear that. No one who's paying $30 for gummies wants to hear that. They're like, I want the same thing I got last time. It's just, and you have people making these natural products. So we have to expect inconsistency, which is again, not a popular opinion. But that's that's if we really remind ourselves, this is plant medicine. Plant medicine gives us what we need in that moment. And we hope that the benefits come. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Interesting. All right. Oh, it's fascinating. All right. Let's just go back to you. Uh, when you decided to go into the cannabis industry, how did your family react? Was there outcry or sadness or did people believe you or how did this work <laughs> for you? <laughs> I have a teenage daughter who shames me every day. So. <laughs> Wow. Hard Mom, car. what are you doing? Don't <laughs> tell anyone what you do. Oh, you smell like cannabis. So I'm just like, you know, there's that. Um, <laughs> I'll cry to you about that later. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I don't know about other relatives or people in your life who like when this is, did you make an announcement? Like, how did this work? No, answer, in, interestingly enough, I told no one other than my spouse and my child. And then people started to find out like, so you're working with cannabis? I'm like, oh, yeah. You know, and then you get your opinions, you know, some positive, some not so positive. It's just kind of, to me, it's plant medicine. You know, I've been an advocate for plant medicine for decades. And whether it's lemon balm, chamomile, cannabis, peppermint, like I think they're all valid forms of healing that we should all consider. Unfortunately, this plant cannabis comes with so many historical illegalities and you know, um, it separate, has separated us in so many ways, racially. I mean, it comes with, unfortunately, so many um, negative ties to it that we often can't even see it as valid medicine because we got to deal with the stigma. And so that I think is sad, you know, now you see psilocybin becoming more popular and you're, you know, you see more research I'm, in my world, I'm seeing more research for psilocybin than I am for cannabis. So oh, absolutely. Oh, that's a whole other discussion. I know, yeah. I know. So I sorry, so this is like my little connection to MAP. So the multi, uh, multidisciplinary association of psychedelic studies, the founder yeah. Rick Doblin is a member of my temple. So okay. on Yom Kippur, my husband's like, is that Rick in the back? I'm like, <laughs> should I go talk to him? <laughs> oh, wow. 
but I know that his whole mission has been 50 years of, of like trying to get this as medical. Like this is like has been yeah. his mission and cannabis has sort of done this messy thing that we've done. And now it's really yeah. a business, which it really shouldn't be. It should have come in. We should have gotten doctors and nurses on board and talked about this as a medicine before we decided everyone was going to get rich off it, which they aren't. So, <laughs> well, that's another story. That's so. another one. But, <laughs> but you, again, you see it. So, all right. So yeah. people were like, hmm, scared. All right. So do you talk about it now? To your friends and family? Yeah, I mean, so now everyone's like, you got any samples? You know? Yeah. <laughs> so that's usually the question I get. Got any samples for me? And I'm like, uh, of course I do. <laughs> do they saddle up to you like in random places and tell you what they're consuming, like in my life? <laughs> well, you know, I will say it, as a healthcare practitioner, you kind of get that all. Oh, that's true. Right? Yeah, it's true. You're that's in true. a grocery store and someone's like, hey, look at this rash on my, you know? <laughs> and so now it's like, well, cannabis cure this rash, you know? It's like, <laughs> jump right to me here's the rash well can i take cannabis for it and i'm like sure yeah <laughs> that's good you're spreading joy um all right so your family was fine and um do you have a favorite way to consume how do you like integrate cannabis into your own life now i mean all plant medicines i assume but yeah, yeah um i love tea so tea is my favorite way i have been playing around with my own little tea formulations um i typically infuse honey and oh, then i, like I add the honey to my tea but i i have recently been adding in a little bit of flour and trying different methods of um consuming tea but that's my tea is my my drug of choice uh and then i've been able to add cannabis to the tea <laughs> yes oh, yeah i well get yourself a cup of tea or roll yourself a joint i think that's a perfect way to spend an <laughs> afternoon um all right uh we are actually up on time let's see uh uh anything coming up for you i know we met on the you were on one of the National Association of Black Cannabis Lawyers luncheons, I think. So that's where we actually yes. met each other. And then are you um, are you at any events coming up? Are you doing any things? I know that there's lots of events across the country. I don't know what's going on in Missouri, yeah. but things that you want to connect with people on. Yeah, um, I'll be speaking at CanX Jamaica next Ooh, month. So I'm excited nice. about that. Yeah, <laughs> that fun, right? um, that's a good yeah. perk. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's I, I do love uh, being able to speak. I do have another, I don't want to misquote it, but I do yeah. have another um, event I'll speak at, I'm speaking at, which is I think the Cannabis Lawyers Association. Okay, yeah. That and I, you, yeah. and do you do any work with like seniors in Missouri or policy work or anything at that level now? Are you um, doing that? So interestingly enough, I do more clinical work with okay. seniors. Um, so part of my, so I always say I treat my, my patient base are either pediatrics or seniors. I, I don't care about anyone in between. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> but, fine. Everyone fine. is fine. Everyone are fine. <laughs> um, so pediatrics, but with seniors looking at uh, a lot of my focus and my continuing ed and potential research will be on things like Alzheimer's or dementia, Parkinson's and how those um, just kind of the aging brain and ways that we can use herbs as neuroprotective and reducing um, comorbidities or reducing the onset of dementia, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's. So that's, well, that's where good. a lot of the core of my work is focused on uh, with seniors. That's fabulous. All right. So my own mother did not believe me. I used to bring in CBD lotions and salves, give them to our friends so their hands would feel better. Yeah. Thought it was like a gateway drug, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but again, I will say knowing that someone like you exist is great because my own mother's always concerned was how do her pharmaceuticals interact and no one could tell her because the doctors were okay yeah. with me saying I wanted to introduce it to her but no one could help me guide her yeah that and that's so I do training actually for some local um, offices although I have done some training for offices virtually mm -hmm. uh, medical offices because you I have colleagues and friends who are they've taken the training but they're not necessarily advocates for cannabis and I, I'm fine with that because as yeah. long as they're informed I don't want a physician saying no just for the you know no sake like say no and be well informed about it so okay. I you know I try to teach as, as clinically you know relevant as possible provide the science and then at least you have this background and as a practitioner you can then you know make you know uh, educated assessments on your patients so yes. I'm I'm always open to doing those uh, trainings good and she talks around the world and just just trying to spread this message all right so if someone wants to reach you connect with you talk with you what is the best way to connect with you um yeah um, yeah <laughs> um, I, I do have a website www.menthealth.org which my email is the same donate domain jamila j-a-m-i-l-a at mint health that's like peppermint m-i-n-t on mm -hmm. um, the word health.org so email is great um 
website. You can call me. You can text me, but just tell me who you are if you text me. <laughs> She's very <laughs> accessible. <laughs> I'm horrible at texting. My phone number is 314-677-4041. So. She's there to help you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jamila, for joining us and talking about this and explaining the science of it because this is not magic. This is science. It's and science. Yeah. I I the molecules, the what these what these products are, they're just not magic little products, they're actually part of the plant medicine and we get them, extract them in very specific ways. And it, it impacts how you experience it. So that's important to know. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be on your show. I really appreciate you taking the time. And I love that you're creating a space for people and just providing insight, education, and a look into like what cannabis really is. So thank you. I appreciate you for doing this. Thank you. And now, uh, you know, these are the stories that are crushing the stigma. So yeah. another show for my guest, Dr. Jamila Owens Todd. You can get in touch with her, her show no information in the show notes, and my Canna Bro David Jazz, and of course, my Canna Mom Show team. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to the Canna Mom Show, where we are on a mission to enhance the impact women have on the emerging cannabis industry by sharing and preserving their stories of love, kindness, wisdom, and hope. Thank you for following and sharing the inspiring stories of the women building this new industry. So together, we can crush that stigma around cannabis and caregivers. I'm your host, Joyce Gerber. This is the Canna Mom Show, and we are a production of Pod 617, the Boston Podcast Network. <laughs> Mom. Why won't they say it? Kanamam. <laughs> 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 <laughs>